Well, it is finally here. The biggest game of the season, probably the biggest derby in the last five, six, seven, maybe even 10 years. This derby could decide the league title. It probably will decide the league title. And it's coming up this Sunday. Enda here, back on the Huddle Breakdown, alongside Alan Morrison. Hello, how are you? Yeah, very well, thanks. Yeah, that's a, a bold statement. I'm not sure. Completely agree. I think it depends who wins, actually. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, no, listen, it's your job to hype it all up, so crack on. <laughs> yeah, listen, it's it's the same as anything. If we lose, yeah, the match doesn't really matter that much. There's still plenty of the season left to go. But if we win, Celtic are favourites to go on and uh, claim the title. James is with me as well. James, how are you? I'm good, and I'm displaying uh, how vulnerable I am to peer pressure. I got huge ball busting last week because I wore – I had the temerity to wear wear a blue shirt. Um, oh, me too. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? My, my, my daughter goes to the University of Pittsburgh, which, you know, they have the color of blue, and um, they got screwed out of an NCAA March Madness tournament bid. So that was my, you know – expression of of uh of uh ha- saying how horrible that was so i've got my proper colors on today because a few people in the comments were ripping me apart for wearing blue so my apologies to those couple of people well listen at least you're secure enough in your masculinity that you can wear blue and feel like it doesn't represent the fact that you are an undercover rangers fan that's like Imagine allowing Rangers to steal the color blue so you can't enjoy it. That'd be ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Blue blue <laughs> is actually the it's the uh, national color of Ireland, would you believe? People think it's green. Oh. It is not. It is uh, The c- official color of Ireland is royal blue, to be exact. Um, it was a big controversy here last year. Ireland brought out a 100-year uh, anniversary kit for their national team, and it was uh, a dark, dark blue. As opposed to clearly the, imperialism, the famous green, yeah, yeah, that's it. Anyway, we're that's not here to talk about. I, know, I, just, I just to explain my dark blue T-shirt is really in, <laughs> in uh, empathy with the Scottish Football Association, and and in particular John Beaton because obviously you know he's been hounded and punished for his t- temerity to re-referee the game at Hearts, and 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 his punishment is uh, uh, checks notes. Oh yes, to referee the derby. So <laughs> I'm, I'm wearing dark blue in sympathy for Mr. Beaton. <laughs> yeah, it's not quite uh, well, well, well. Look, it's as if my uh, actions have consequences. It's more so, oh, well, well, well. I get rewarded for uh, being incompetent. More for, uh, but we'll see. We'll we'll see how much we touch on Mister Beaton later on in the show because I don't want to start off this show on a who's refereeing refereeing the game situation because there are two teams involved as well. Uh, big news this week seems to be that Cal McGregor is back in training, and uh, Chris Sutton was saying in the news there that. He doesn't think that Cal McGregor should start the game if he's not 100% fit because of the severity of the consequences if Celtic lose the game and he doesn't want to see somebody who's not completely match, match fit going into such a game. And So he was advocating for Tomoki Iwata to start that game alongside Rio Hatate and Matt O'Reilly. So I, I guess, lads, it's been a while since I've been on the show. Uh, Rio Hatate has returned to the midfield. He was absolutely brilliant last week, I have to say. And Alan, the midfield seems to function a little bit better with, you know, surprise, surprise, a better player playing in that position. Well, it's, they're all different types of player. And I think, you know, as we touched on on earlier in the week, uh, when James and I looked at the Livingston game, um, you know, last season, when you considered the, 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 the central midfielders that you had to choose from, Again, they all have strengths and weaknesses, and and you could make a case for any of them really, uh, and equally Hitati. Whereas this season, because of the overall quality deficit in the squad, Hitati's nudged that much further forward in terms of the the pecking order, I think. And you know, his some of his capabilities, skills are in in sharp contrast actually to, for example, Bernardo. So here we're talking about his ability to drop into space, his ability to receive the ball and already be looking forward, and his ability to pass forward. Uh, quickly and directly, and um, these are all these were all uh, fine attributes which um, he displayed against Livingston, and and you know were great to see. So I think it's it's um, it it does give a different dimension to it. Um, for me, the other impact of having Hitati in the team that is beneficial to Celtic is that it means that O'Reilly can then focus on being more the advanced midfielder as opposed to the the one that kind of 
sits next to McGregor a little bit more and, and helps him out. Um, and, and, that, and that has hugely beneficial for Celtic because uh, putting O'Reilly further forward means he connects more with um, Kyogo. And that is a very beneficial partnership for Celtic. Um, if you look at just this season, uh, and this hasn't been as I say, a very particularly coherent season, then you know of the 111 shots that Kyogo has had, O'Reilly set up 22 of them. Uh, six of those were actually assists. Um, and of the 98 shots that O'Reilly has had, Kyogo set up 12 of them, three of them uh, being assists. So, and, and you know, they obviously they, they combined for the winning goal at Ibrox in September as well, when they exploited uh, a particularly pedestrian backline, which I think will be the same one that we see on Sunday. So I think the Hitate being in the team has some all-round benefits. It gets the team moving forward better. Um, his use of space is better. To be balanced, it also then introduces a little bit of risk, as I've spoken of before on the left-hand side, where we know that you know the combination of Taylor, Scales and Hatati, that's three players who all occasionally give the ball away in a sort of hands-on head kind of way. And also, you know, the, the sort of um, a little ability to resist a transitional counter-attack on that side is, isn't, isn't the best. And certainly much weaker than what we have on the other side where you've got O'Reilly, Johnson and Carter Vickers. So, um, yeah, so, so the, obviously, like, like anything, there's going to be positives and minuses, mm. but in, in general, you know, I think Hatati raises the attacking uh, bar for the team, raises our ability to get forward. And I think because this game will be one where counter-attacking opportunities will be um, far greater than possibly any other game we've played this season, um, then Hatati's ability to, to, to position and play quickly and forward, I think, could, could be could be game changing. Actually, yeah, it's sort of one of those domino effect things, James. Because I just from the eye test alone, the amount of times that you see or have seen Matt O'Reilly picking up the ball off the right back, off Johnston, passing it to Cam McGregor, and then suddenly there's nobody in that pocket in front of them to link the forwards, and that's where you see Kyogo then dropping into that hole to try fill that gap, and then when it finally reaches the wingers. Kyogo's not in the box because he's too busy playing the number 10 role. So it is, it was just disjointed and non-functional. So it is like, it is that thing that Al mentions and it just allows Matt O'Reilly to play his game. Rio Tati's playing his game and then be that Tomo, Tomoki Iwata or Cal McGregor, they're playing the key role as that pivot in front of the defense. For Rio Tati himself, like we talk about risks and the risks he takes, but those risks are more important in these games, James, I would say, because there are few and far between chances, as we know from the derby matches previously. So you need the, the players that are actually going to be able to capable of creating those chances. That's not to say that Paolo Bernardo didn't score a lovely goal against Rangers last time out, but Hatate is the more creative uh, player out of the two of them, you would say. Bernardo's goal was an example. I mean, it was kind of luck. There's nothing that was really created out of that. It was Seema headed a ball right to him, <laughs> and he had a brilliant finish. And that's, you know, part of the the, the chaotic part of, um, of of the game and, you know, what ultimately can decide these types of uh, uh, derby matches. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, the, the difference is, you know, as, as Alan has said, they're almost like, um, you know, opposite types of players. Uh, and, and so, you know, you're going to get a lot safer from Bernardo. You're probably on balance, not getting a lot of creativity, but you're also not going to get a whole lot of risk out of him. Uh, meaning that in, you know, providing opportunity for Rangers in transition, whereas Hitate, you get that upside, the huge potential upside, um, like he's displayed in the past, like the, you know, the great ball across the Abada and a Derby and, you know, countless other examples that he's, he's displayed. Um, but he can also get caught in possession. Uh, he's probably not going to be the one that stops uh, Rangers on a counterattack <laughs> in a swift, you know, um, uh, carrying of the ball through midfield that the Amane or Lundstrom might do, or, you know, even Suter or somebody, you know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's a dual edged sword. So I, I absolutely think that, um, you know, he skew things significantly towards the creative side, but it does come at some risk and a potential cost. And that that's ultimately how, you know, one of the great uh, uncertainties going into the game is how all these things settle out, particularly given the fact that he's basically got an hour under his belt um, after being out for, for so long. 
um, and really not played that much this season. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, I think most people are just automatically assuming it's going to be Hitate. Um, that's kind of my, you know, I, that if I have to bet, I would bet on Hitate, but I wouldn't be surprised to see Bernardo either. Like that would not shock me. Like, I don't think it's a 5% chance. I think it's probably more like 60, 40 in the favor of Hitate would be how I would, I would lay it out. Mm. Well, for his defensive sort of what, what Bernardo brings defensively, I would probably lean towards that if Rogers is going for that side of the play, but for counterattacking for passing ability for ability to open up the Rangers defense that's where Hitate sort of has the edge isn't it well and I to me it at least on a probability for, you know again thinking about probabilities for me the 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 fulcrum for this is whether McGregor plays or not because if you have McGregor playing you know it's almost impossible that he'll be a hundred percent match fit I mean that's you know I don't even think that's possible um so do you introduce Hitate with him at the same time, what that might mean for vulnerabilities defensively and in transition? I mean, two guys that probably can't be 100% match fit. Yes, that's going to mean a lot better build up and transition attacking wise. Um, whereas if you have a Wada in there, you know, then I think the argument for Hitate actually goes up because he helps a lot in transition um, in attack and build up most importantly, which we'll get into a little bit later as far as how, uh, Rangers are playing under Clement versus how they did under Beal. Um, so I, I think that's a huge part of those. That what I would be ironically, the, the combo that I'd be a little bit more concerned about is if it is McGregor and Hitate, like I, to me, that, that is, um, has more risk. And I, when I say, I don't worry, I mean, I, I just think that the, the risk of that could be huge. I mean, we might, that might be what facilitates a three nil type of result, uh, w- which would obviously be glorious, but it also could mean, you know, if things don't work out cause they're not quite fit or sharp, that kind of thing. Um, it could also break the other way. Mm. Alan is bouncing up and down. So I'm going to bring him in. On this. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yes, let's yeah, let's not dig into that. Mm. Yeah, listen, I think that's right. You know, pitching in two central midfielders, you know, possibly the most physically demanding uh, part of the of, of the field, part of the game. Uh, neither of whom are going to going to like you say, going to be any, anywhere near capable, probably, of, of lasting ninety minutes realistically. Um, is that a toxic combination too far? I I think he will. And the reason I think he will is because of what I, my reading of Rogers as a manager, I believe he will take the view that Celtic need to be front foot and 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 and, and score the first goal. Um, because if Celtic don't score the first goal, uh, and and if you're kind of playing a little bit more conservatively, which is what Iwata and Bernardo would give you, and you'd probably maybe play you a little bit deeper and a little bit less progressive when you have the ball. If Celtic go one 0 down, it becomes a really difficult afternoon with you know the nature of, the, of that crowd, etc. But if Celtic go one up, one nil up, that place will turn very quickly. Uh, we know this, and we know from what their captain James Deverney has said in the past that those players don't like playing in front of that crowd uh, when it, when the pressure's on. So I think, and I think Rogers' nature is to be uh, you know positively aggressive. So I, I'm I'm going to say that he will go with McGregor and. Um, Bernardo, and then if if you get one nil up and you want to tighten the game up, Iwata and Bernardo are probably good players to to come on to do that. So uh, that's just that's just my hunch based on you know Rogers mm. watching, I suppose. Well, final point on this, I guess, is the intangible qualities of the players and of what this game sort of represents, Alan. Because I, I remember you you mentioned before about the mindset of the game and about the the state of both clubs going into previous derby matches, mainly last year where Rangers absolutely needed to win it and it was completely on them to to come and do something. Whereas in this game, it's sort of like whoever wins this, I, I don't want to be too dramatic, but it genuinely is probably whoever wins this game goes goes on to win the title, goes on to get Champions League football next year and could decide where the derby is in, for the next five, six years, depending on uh, the money that both clubs have as a result of this this game, the pressure is on both teams. And I think if McGregor is 80% fit, 
the intangible qualities that he has as a person and as a Celtic uh, captain, what he brings to the, the derby matches is that extra level of performance. I think he would be able to tap into some sort of like some adrenaline and some of that, uh, you know, I don't know what, what you would call. There's no real word for what I'm trying to describe here, but he, he has that get up and at him sort of attitude when it comes to the derbies. And that could bring an 80% fit McGregor to a 95% fit McGregor. And that to me is, is enough, I think. I never really realized until reading some of the social media around this game, I didn't realize how terrified uh, the Rangers fans are of McGregor. They're absolutely terrified of him. And they've seen him, you know, we you know, use terms like boss the game and dominate the game. People that listen to this pod know that these are completely empty, you know, phrases that don't really mean anything. But, um, you know, essentially what it meant in, in September was that McGregor got on the ball relatively a lot compared to other midfielders. He had the most packed passes, the highest pack, pass packing score, uh, etc. So that's kind of what it meant in terms of he was allowed to play at his pace. I think from memory in September, Michael Beale's big um, big idea was to put Kumar Roof onto him or something crazy like that. Um, in, in this game, you know, the natural choice would be your most advanced midfielder, which will probably be Todd Cantwell. Um, fantastic if that's what they decide to do because you know, Cantwell's a little bit free and easy when it comes to team orders and instructions and tends to like to run about a lot doing what the hell he wants. So that would kind of be good. But yeah, as I say, I think the, the, that spine, that's, which we always talk about the spine of the team, and it is important. They're terrified of Kyogo, they're terrified of McGregor, and Carter Vickers looked pretty strong, I thought, against Livingston. Um, and that spine uh, is, is gonna, has got to give you confidence. Mm. Right then, let's talk about actual real life stuff then, James, because I know you prefer that. Uh, it's been, <laughs> what, four months now since um, Celtic have played, or three and a half months since Celtic have played this Rangers team. It's like, it really is like Philip Clement's actual team now, as opposed to, you know, it was still early doors ish for him at that point in time. Um, what has changed under him? What kind of way are they playing now that people who, don't watch Rangers, which I fall into, uh, wouldn't know too much about them. I, there, there's been, you know, as, as with uh, any team that has the primary uh, same players, I mean, and uh, with the competitive dynamics that, that Rangers have in Scotland, I mean, there's not going to be tectonic shifts usually. I mean, they, they tend to be on the margin, even if they're significant. Uh, it's within that context on the margin. And I, I'd say that's been the big shifts with um, Clement's tenure versus Beal is a couple. They're, they're um, more front-footed in attack. They're, they're a little less um, conservative when it comes to defending. Uh, and, and they like to have a shot. They like to have a pop. So uh, actually what's going on with um, Clement's tenure is they're averaging over two shots more per game. Uh, so that's, if you look at kind of differentials, like XG differentials, that kind of thing, it's improved under Clement, but it's quantity over quality. It's not that they've gotten better chances. It's that they're just shooting more. Um, and, they, you know, again, to his credit, they haven't really given up much more in the way of chances as a cost of doing that, so to speak. Um, but the decision-making on shooting has actually gotten worse under Clement. So, and that kind of makes sense. Like if you're kind of forcing things and you're not introducing more creative players uh, in order to do that, then, you know, you're just kind of taking more bad shots, you know, from distance, for example, and that's their average shot has kind of gone further out. Um, so as I said, I, I would kind of summarize it as, as uh, quantity over quality. Um, the other thing is they are pressing higher and more aggressively. Um, but that's also coming at a cost, which is that they're more vulnerable to counterattacks. And that's, you, you've seen that, um, on average. And again, within the context of domestic, <laughs> uh, uh, football for, for Celtic or Rangers, you know, we're not talking huge amounts here, but on average, Beals Rangers did not concede counterattack shots at any kind of significance, uh, you know, like a quarter of one shot per game. So they were basically giving up one shot every four games, and that's gone up to like three quarters of a shot per game. So like, you know, two shots every three games type of thing. Uh, so that 
again, we're not talking huge things because of um, the level of opponent that they're facing, but that's a that's a, a flag, you know. That to me, that's a uh, a signal from the noise, and that makes sense relative to the fact that they are pressing higher. They're a little more front footed in that regard. Um, now, whether or not they come out and do all of this relative to Celtic and the game plan, that's a whole separate question. Um, I think the other thing that they they typically do, uh, and and this is a variant depending on what he decides to do with the selection, I suspect he'll go with Cantwell over Lawrence. Um, but what, what Alan said is true. Cantwell's more of a, a go-anywhere guy. And, and in their buildup, what they typically do, and they play 4-2-3-1, is Lundstrom, you know, the old Scott Brown role when we played 4-2-3-1, even under Rogers' first tenure, is he drops in, in between the center backs and they go kind of back three, or he'll drop to the left and become the left center back in a back three. And then you have Diamande and uh, uh, Cantwell will drop in uh, to help that build up into midfield. So they kind of have a three, two, five in their, their in possession buildup. Um, so I, I think with, you know, the full backs push forward, you know, um, now they've had some variation on that, like, Tavernier will tuck in and depending on, you know, it's dynamic. So there, that's the one thing that Clement has done is, um, Beal's, Beal's setup was a little more rigid, uh, whereas with Clement, you'll see more interchanging. So if, you know, Tavernier bombs on, then supposedly somebody should drop in to fill that space. So, um, you know, that kind of thing, or, or Tavernier will tuck inside and fill in if Diamande makes a run, for example. So you see a little more of that under, uh, Clement than you did where it was just, you know, Tavernier bomb forward. There was no, <laughs> there was no, um, tweaking of that. Uh, so it's a little more variant under, under Clement. So, um, those are the big differences. And outside of that, I, like I said, it's, there's not huge differences. The other thing I would just say is competitively, the one, the other thing I I get concerned about, again, relative to the fact that we have three key players coming off of long-term injuries or significant injuries is outside of that Derby match around the new year, we haven't really played anyone good for a while. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, so, you know, combine injuries coming back and not really, uh, other than training, facing, you know, higher quality players, um, where, you know, Rangers have had the Benfica games, at least within close proximity, uh, mm. to kind of test these things. Um, so that would be another, you know, area of concern on a relative basis that, uh, you know, we're, we're maybe not as sharp as we could be at, against higher competition. Um, so on, on a very slight margin that would be a a concern Mm. well i mean that could go either way that could also work in the favor of celtic in that they had a few tune-up games in terms of getting that confidence level up a a little bit Uh, some key players returning in non-pressurized or less pressurized uh, games like Hatate coming coming back against Livingston, um, you know we 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 have Kuhn who's finally starting to show a little bit of form. He's got his confidence up. He looks like a player who who's playing with a little bit of confidence. Kyogo scoring goals again. Uh, Carter Vickers isn't you know damaging or killing his his knee by having to to make last ta- tackles the entire time. I mean there there is the benefits of also not having high pressurized or or difficult games on the run into the derby as well, but. Um, Alan, in terms of how Celtic play against Rangers, then I mean the way that James is describing it, there's there's two ways it could go. It could be an absolute disaster in that their high press um, works in the same way that Hearts is high pressed it, and we just shit ourselves on the ball and give it away constantly, <laughs> or it creates space for players to run into and we exploit it. So uh, which one is it going to be? I think this game, in terms of Celtic's weaknesses, which we know is all down the left side. Um, you know, for the likes of Scales and even Taylor. Taylor's a pretty decent defender, and I think Scales is actually a better footballer when when his game is is uncomplicated and he's maybe just asked to defend. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's his tempo setting and his ability to bring the ball out and and make good decisions quickly that is his downfall in a, in a possession dominant side. But you know, the last game at Ibrox, he was excellent. He defended the box really well, and I would expect that he could do that again. And as I say, I wouldn't have too many. So what I'm trying to say is that some of the weaknesses that Celtic has aren't so much of an issue in this game. Um, and, and actually some of the latent strengths that Celtic have, this is almost a perfect opportunity because we don't get to see Celtic counterattacking that often. 
in you know home to St Johnson or or way to Livingston or what have you, and that front three is absolutely rapid, and Kuhn is probably the quickest of the three. Um, I mean he's 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 kind of racked up some impressive numbers in the last three matches. In three matches, he's and bear in mind he's not had ninety minutes, right? So this isn't even per ninety minutes. This is way higher. These numbers would be far higher per ninety minutes. But he's had something like well, he's had thirty eight. Uh, Possessions in the opposition penalty box, seven shots, one goal. His total XG is like 1.24. He's created 12 chances, uh, two assists off of 1.94 uh, expected uh, assists. So, and uh, you know that that that's a really that's a really encouraging uh, run of form. And I don't and that's him trying to, you know, we've seen Coot with Coot. He's like a, almost a atypical winger in that you know those times when he just runs down, runs into dead ends, and he. You know, he looks like he's got a great burst of pace, and then it all kind of fizzles out, and nothing much happens. All that, right? But you know, like, like most players, the more space you give them, and the more time you give them, the more you'll you'll see the best of them. And the chances are, in this game, he's going to get moments where he has got the field in front of him, and he has got time and space to run into. So I think that aspect, and obviously, we know that Maeda is not the best forward to have against the low block, but he probably is a good forward to have with space in behind with a, an attacking fullback to keep occupied and Tavernier, who's by by miles their most creative player. And if and if Maeda keeps him quiet as well as offering the threat in behind. And then we know that Kyogo, if he's got his mate beside him and O'Reilly, as as James as you said, uh, Ender, he's not going to be needing to be dropping into that ten space so much. He's gonna play on the shoulder. And we've seen, you know, um I, I did a I did a stats bomb comparison of scales and suitor. And and although Suter does is far more effective in aerial duels. That's not really going to be the game that matters on Sunday. In in all other aspects of of play, you know, actually skills is come you know would, would come out top in that sort of stats bomb profile comparison, right? So, um, when you talk to ex players, players that have played in this game, um, one of the things they put large store on is actually is, is the experience of playing in this game. Yeah, you know, and and if you look at the Celtic team, virtually everyone apart from Kuhn in that team. Have been to Ibrox and won, like with no fans, and have beaten that side in important games. You look at their team. Yeah, you've got Tavernier and Goldson. You could say that is the case, but they're also scarred by defeat after defeat after defeat after defeat. And these things, these these are mental mental aspects that do that do matter, and it's a cumulative thing. If it was one or two players either way, I wouldn't even be talking about it. Celtic have got a squad of player and a manager who. All other variance factors to one side, ho, 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 no laughing at the back, um, have got a squad of players that know they can go to that place in the atmosphere and win the game. They don't, by and large, right? And that that is huge. Mm-hmm. That is hugely important, I think. Um, but again, there'll be variance factors. We, we know that. We've seen we've seen a trend. We've seen a switch in trend since, since Tynecastle in that regard. Two big decisions last weekend, horrendous. Um, what was the common pattern? Good, who benefits? It's all that, right? We know that, okay? So, um, unfortunately, we're in a position where we just have to hope that there isn't an opportunity, there isn't a stray elbow, there isn't a, a dive in the box where there's a little bit of contact and there's an opportunity. And also that, you know, um, and, and that Celtic, you know, can do, their, can, can do their stuff on the ball. But, yeah. Mm-hmm. I know James he doesn't like to talk about experience, and as I, I wouldn't raise this, but I think it's just such an overwhelming feature of the two the two squads in this that I think it's it's mm. worth it's worth considering as a factor. Yeah, on on Kuhn, just to finish off on on Kuhn himself, um, I think the the trend actually is down to uh, me calling a player shit, and then <laughs> them going on to prove me wrong. Um, I I I said that Kuhn wouldn't be up to the standard of Celtic and he's gone on this form. And I also said that Ida wouldn't be good enough and he scored, what, six goals in his first seven games or something? Well, <laughs> so so, listen, so I, maybe I, I should I, just write you're, off you're, all you're, the players. You're obviously an avid reader of the Scottish Sun, and uh, because uh, the, the Scottish <laughs> Sun were, 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 were full of glee when we signed Kuhn. We even had a, a headline that said that, oh, he's injury prone and terrible. Like they, were, they were just like they couldn't believe in luck, sort of thing. You know, they could they could they could you know, put down Celtic's new signing, sort of thing. So, I think he's going to be a little bit of a secret weapon because I don't think people expect know what to expect of him. Uh, mm. You know, and as I say, many in the Scottish press who 
that side of the city will read will have read that and thought I've just written him off. Uh, he, he ain't no well, Rabbi Matondo. <laughs> no. Well, let's let's rephrase the experience thing a little bit then, Jibs. The experience, as I see it, where it matters in these derbies, is not doing silly things, not making silly mistakes. Um, although you, you can have experience and still make silly mistakes, they're less likely to happen if you are concentrated and you keep your head and you know uh, how to deal with pressurized situations. That's all human nature. A, 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 a sort of a trend in these last couple of games have been, last couple of games against Rangers have been Celtic scoring early, being pretty comfortable within the game, you know, Travenier looks like he's, you know, devastated the world, the weight of the world's on top of him. And then all of a sudden, somebody dives in, gives a free kick away at the edge of the box, and Tavernier sticks it in the top corner. And suddenly, Rangers are all over Celtic until the end of the the game, and it's it's nerves all round. That's what I don't want to see in this game. I would say is that we don't want anybody making silly mistakes in that giving away silly set pieces because we know how dangerous they can be from those and the person probably most likely to do that is i would say the likes of bernardo someone playing in the midfield that you know has a loose touch tries to win it back is a little bit careless gives away a free kick i don't see that with the experienced players that alan mentioned there um in cal mcgregor rio Tate, uh even greg taylor to an extent i think they're a little bit more sensible Sensible sensibility is what I would say, as opposed to experience. Yeah, I, I think the so the way I read it is that the screw things up quotient for both teams is actually pretty equal, meaning that we both have our um, you know relative deficiencies in build up. For example, um, you know if if Awada is playing over McGregor, for example, even McGregor. I mean, McGregor had a I was you know rewatching some of the 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 new year's derby uh this week and um you know mcgregor had a really bad giveaway and you know so it happens like players aren't perfect um and it you know so it can happen i wad is probably a little more inclined lundstrom is a bomb scare at times on the ball uh particularly at the higher level you know some of the you know giveaways he had against benfica for example were just you know um potentially catastrophic, but that goes to the flip side of this, you know, so it's not like Hart or Scales or Taylor or even McGregor are, you know, um, above giving the ball away in, if, especially if they're being high pressed under intensity with higher level athletes than they've been playing against recently, uh, or for a distance of time. That's kind of my concern from the prior comment. Um, the flip side of that is what does the opposition do when that happens? And that's where I think we have a huge advantage. This is where the Kyogo factor comes in, <laughs> you know, and that, that's why all other things equal, we have Kyogo and they don't, um, you know, and, and that that's, he has the ability to really make the opposition pay in a more open game. And, and that, again, if you go back to uh, the new year's Derby, you had, uh, O'Reilly dragged Balogun out of position. I'm not sure why he was man marking O'Reilly to the point where he would get dragged out of position. That's a whole nother conversation, but um, that opened up space for Kyogo to pick up the ball and then just have a brilliant move um, and and you know score from what was it 20 yards top shelf. You know that that's the kind of thing. And, and if you give the ball away like they've done in the past and Kyogo's in proximity to be able to be the one on the end of the chance. And that's where Rangers, you know, there, there were two huge opportunities that we gifted them in that Derby. One dropped to McClauslin, who basically had an easy little pass to a wide open teammate that would have been a tap in goal. And he shoots instead. And another one was Dessers who, you know, frequently makes the wrong decision uh, in, in good opportunities in their attack. So it's not that they are, um, absent of players that can do that. You know, Tavernier we've seen over and over again, can be a tremendous finisher. Um, Seema has displayed that he can be a bit of a mess on the ball. Don't even know if he'll start, but I assume he'll play a role at some point if he doesn't, but he can finish and, you know, pull off one of those kind of worldly finishes, Silva, maybe, you know, he's a, of a quality. Uh, I haven't really seen a ton of that from him yet, but I suspect he, 
at least has it in them, kind of like, you know, Bernardo does for us. Um, so, you know, but the key players, you know, Dessers and, you know, whoever they end up forming on the right wing, whether it's Sterling or McClauslin uh, or Matondo, you know, probably less so. So I, I think that's the interplay of screw ups versus what you do with those screw ups, I think tilts a little bit in our favor, hopefully. Mm. That's that we talked about the spine. I mean, that's if you look at that spine, you've got Goldson who seems to be getting quite a bit slower and getting caught out. I'm just going by their own message boards on this that they seem to be very critical of him. Lundstrom, we know, is incredibly limited, especially the higher level he plays. And then Dessers, you know, compare that to the Celtic spine. So I was listening to the, um, so this brings in some of your expertise, James. Um, I was listening to the Eaton's uh, podcast yes, last, last night and uh, they were talking about how bookies look at these games and they essentially do like a player by player matchup. So you take the two goalkeepers, you take the two right backs, you take the two mm. left, the right center. You compare them man for man and say, right, that goalkeeper is worth 0.5 more than, you know, do, do, do. And, I was, and, and they were talking about that. And, and I was thinking, well, if, I'm, listen, I'm biased, right? But if I was going to do that with what I think of the starting 11s, other than Butland, absolutely, but the other goalkeeper, what other player would you go plus on on their side over the Celtic player? I couldn't think of another one. I mean, you know, you understand what we're saying. Yeah. But you're, you know, you know you're, you're, a, you're a markets and betting man. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that's a good question. Um, again, I, I think the... Um, it depends on what facet of play, right? So um, I think in midfield, it's probably a little closer than most people think. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that it's um, an advantage to, to Rangers at all, but I think the gap there is probably closer. I mean, again, Diamande is another guy who's shown uh, when he does get opportunities, even from distance, he ha- he's shown a real ability to finish. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the, the, the big deficits they have um are potentially lundstrom i mean it's not that he comes without value but he can be brash at times which comes into another discussion that we'll get into as far as how the game is likely to be officiated uh which is a concern Uh, and i don't mean that from a conversation of of uh uh alan's extracurricular activities recently but more so just stylistically if it's a more if the game's allowed to turn into more of a physical rugby match which wouldn't be surprising it's at ibrooks you know, regardless of the match official that, you know, you tend to get some home field bias, that kind of thing. Uh, Derby matches tend to, you know, the officials don't want to be overly uh, influential early in the game. They tend to let things go a little bit. They don't want to be brandishing yellow cards early, that kind of thing. So, you know, that, that um, there is some value there from Lundstrom, but, you know, he, he can also really, um, be a deficit on and making mistakes. And I agree with you that their center backs, that's where I think we also have a big advantage on average. It's not that Carter Vickers can't have a, 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 a huge mistake in them, but um, that Goldson and, and Suter really, you know, and, and again, because they have been offering more uh, counterattacking opportunities to the opposition um, that exposes them and they, they do play a fairly high line. And that is a strength of ours with our speed in, in the front three, likely. Um, so yeah, I, I would agree with you. I mean, I, the, 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 the keeper position is, is, um, probably the most obvious one, but I, I think some of the other ones would probably be closer than what most Celtic fans would probably score it. I agree. Yeah. yeah no issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you play huddle breakdown bingo, then um, it's time to mark off variance and randomness on your line, <laughs> and hopefully you'll get closer to it. Uh, risk, risk I mean, it's, it, <laughs> yeah, it's impossible, Alan, to ignore the uh, elephant in the room, or in this case, in the uh, referee's costume uh, for this game. Um, <laughs> look, costume. this is going. Yeah, this is this is going to be this is going to be a difficult game. You're telling, are you telling for... Mrs. Beaton, Beaton she puts too many potatoes on the plate? <laughs> uh, it's look, very unfair. I, I I I don't have any stats around I, I, that. <laughs> no, you don't have any. You do, it'll be like the argument around uh, Stephen Welsh's height. You'll you'll never know truly what uh, John Beaton's weight is. Um, no, like so. This is I I do have some sympathy for him, right? 
because this is a, a, an incredibly difficult game to officiate at the best of times. To do so now in front of a full Ibrox of all Rangers fan, fans makes it even more difficult. To do it in the backdrop of the Brendan Rodgers versus the SFA makes it even more difficult. And to do it in a derby match is probably going to decide the season is another layer layer of difficulty. So I'm not saying that this is an easy job for, for Beaton to do, but you can't ignore the outside pressures that are probably going to influence some decisions in this game. That's all I'm saying, Alan. Well, you know, listen, in terms of what should we expect, if we go to the data, the patterns of assistance for one club are clear, and they're, and they're clear over multiple data points to a statistically significant level. That's the reality of the environment that we operate in. Um, how do you interpret the SFA appointing Don Robertson uh, to the next Celtic game after, after that Hearts uh, debacle? How do you then uh, explain John Beaton, who was on VAR at Tynecastle, and who re-refereed the game twice on behalf of Robertson, who was happy to to stand aside and let him do so, uh, and he then gets appointed the derby. How do you? How can you possibly interpret that in any other way than the SFA sticking up two fingers to Celtic as a football club? And again, that, that, what I'm saying might sound inflammatory, but it's it's all in plain sight. The public data is clear. The the attitude of the Scottish Football Association to Celtic Football Club has been consistently hostile for decades, and all the evidence is there. I don't, I'm don't. i not going to go through it all on this pod. It's, it's, it's all out there, right? But there is a human element to this as well, and I completely agree with you. I think one of the, one of the unintended consequences of the SFA's intransigence and unwillingness to address performance issues in their refereeing sector is that they actually do their referees no favours at all. How does Willie Collum feel when he sees Robertson and Beaton pitched into these matches after after the way that Colin was treated by Rangers Football Club, and he's effectively been shielded and taken away, right? And, and, and almost it's almost like a certain club has, has got their way again. Whereas the SSV think they're sticking up two fingers to Robertson and Beaton. Actually, they're, as you said rightly, they're putting enormous pressure on John Beaton uh, for this game. Which didn't pressure that wasn't necessary, you know. And, and I think the SFA, compl- because they are incompetent, by the way, as well. Um, they they have no no idea, or maybe they don't care about the well being of their own employees. I don't think this does John Beaton any favors at all, refereeing this game at all. And I have great I have great sympathy for him in that regard. Um, I think it's an absolutely ludicrous situation that, that does does the man no favours at all. Anything he does, it doesn't matter what he does, he's going to get absolute pelters. And we've seen, you know, we know in the context of this derby, that fans on both sides can can get out of order when it comes to things like that. So it's predictable because it's the Scottish Football Association. That's where the problem lies. That's what needs to be addressed. John Beaton, in some respect, Willie Collum, are, are, as, are as much in some in a different way victims of SFA incompetences as as all the other clubs bar one in Scotland. Um, so, listen, we're not going to change it. It's in plain sight, right? It's in plain sight. We don't we don't need to talk about this anymore. It's in plain sight. That's what it is. Uh, so it, it it's remarkable to me um, that they would do this. For the reasons, I mean, I'm not surprised, but it's just remarkable because, you know, I could see an argument of, you know, the the throwing your fingers up at Celtic and, and, you know, as a, as a, a a part of that Rogers for what happened after the hearts game. Uh, And I can eat from a human level. I could even understand that, right. As far as like the integrity of the officials and all that, like even, you know, if you take this from a, a steel man argument perspective. I could get that. If uh, Beaton was like this glamour referee from Scotland that's producing, that's, you know, refereeing World Cup finals and is held at such a level of regard in the international game and the refereeing community broadly and that Scottish officials are held up to that regard. And, you know, it's like, well, this is a huge game. Our best officials should be refing it independent of anything. And we're not going to let your, 
you know, partisan crap and calling us cheats and all this other stuff. Like within that context, I could get that, but none of that exists here. And <laughs> so, so to put him it's in this position, pool. right. So to put him in this position is just catastrophically stupid from a governance perspective, from an integrity of the game perspective. Like it, it just, it cannot work out well for anyone involved including Rangers, by the way, no matter what happens in this game, there's going to be a huge cloud cast upon the game, an unnecessary distraction, no matter what happens, no matter how the big calls fall. So if, if a big call ends up, you know, to our surprise, falling in Celtics direction, and we end up winning the game either partly or significantly as a result of that, it's going to be all about how Regardless of the merits of, of the rules and the interpretation of the rules, it's going to be completely labeled as the pressure one. You know, Al Allen's will be enemy number one in public. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I'm not that interesting. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. You, you know what I'm saying, though. It, it, it's going to be all, well, all the pressure campaign and all this other stuff. It worked. Yeah. Whereas yeah. the flip side of that, it's going to be a complete validation. Mm -hmm. of You know, so it's. Where, where all of the stuff that Alan's pointed out is all about over a period of time and, and um, you know, how this has occurred over m m many, many, many games and in any single one game, any single ref is inconsequential. Any single event, any single interpretation of the rules is inconsequential. And that's all going to come cascading into the single game on this one ref and of our official, by the way. Yeah. Um, so it's just a it's an unnecessary mess that they're creating. For what reason? This goes back to Alan's point: the culture, the competence. Like, why would they do this? It has to be I, I, to me the, the the main you know um, explanation is not a good one. I mean, it, it, it you know some combination of get it up you and you know uh, incompetence. Mm. And, and disregard for the welfare of their own employees or not employees, but, you know, their own staff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, terrible. I completely agree with that, James. Like it is a situation where it's a it is a no win for beating this weekend. If he makes a big decision for either side, it's going to well, be he's going to have a big decision it's to make. The, I mean, yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. I, well, that's the thing. This is set I, up I'm, to fail. It's yeah, going to be a disaster yeah. regardless of yeah. who wins or what the result is. It's going to be a mess. And I think, yeah, the uh, the most important aspect of what you brought up there is probably the the standard of referee that Beaton is, and even just the standard of referees in Scotland in general, is that it's not as if Beaton is like miles and miles and miles ahead of everyone else in Scotland in terms of his quality of refereeing in general across the board. I mean, he makes countless mistakes in games that don't involve the two big sides. And I think you see this mainly the the standard of the Scottish referee in general um, in the likes of, say, Bobby Madden, who was one of the top referees in Scotland, went down to England and was tossed down to League One and Two because he wasn't good enough for the higher levels. And that's this uh, you see time and time again. Why are Scottish officials not chosen for big European games? Yeah, they're, not know, let's, let's, they're not let's good look enough at, referees. Let's look objectively at the public data, right? We've just had the referee roster announced for, I think, the Olympic football tournament or something. 46 different countries of officials have been selected for this prestige event, right? Not a single Scottish referee. So, you know, there's there's the public data, okay? If the Scottish FA could spend less time finding ways to get it up Celtic and more time to, you know, provide an environment where their referees are competent, uh, as independent as they can be, and performing to a better level, if they could spend their energies on that, then we might see Scottish referees at these international tournaments. Mm. And just a final point on the referees, the VAR, James, uh, you mentioned, I think that is probably as important as beating this weekend because we've seen how many times a dodgy line can be drawn, drawn on the screen or a dodgy angle or oh, the, the main camera angle is not available to us. So we'll use the one that's located in Hamden Park and uh, has a bird's eye view, but it's, it's blocked out by a crane in the, in the angle. Um, like if Celtic are looking to counterattack, get him behind Rangers, then VAR is going to come into play a couple of times potentially if Celtic score, and there could be a, a, a situation there where the VAR needs to make a big decision under big pressure, and can they get it right? That's the the major question we have on our hands. But 
And, yeah, it, and in fairness, again to Rangers, I mean that how that New Year, uh, New Year's game was officiated was a debacle. Like it, it happened to turn out that you know it's like uh, getting the right answer using the wrong method. Like they they ended up ass backwardsing into the right decision retrospectively, and then you know whether it was some kind of quote unquote cover up or something to backtrack because column was brash or the you know, the, the VAR official was brash and doing whatever they did there. It was not handled well. It was handled poorly, right? But, you know, that's that's the underpinning here is, you know, you have a combination of incompetence with the, the uh, issues that Alan adeptly points out in that mixer. You throw all that into the mixer, you know, that, that that's how you, you, you can know going into this that there are going to be a mess anyway. It's going to be a mess. It's levels of mess that you're pouring gasoline on and, and putting column as the fourth official. Like, again, it's just another <laughs> unnecessary. It's just an obvious reactionary thing that's being done. And again, even beyond, you know, get it up just to Celtic, like, just incompetent. It's just stupid. But James, Beaton James, and James, column in this position. James, it's worse than that because they have two employees whose role, whose dedicated job is to be the VAR full-time, you know, uh, assistants. And they are Andrew Dallas and Greg Aitken. And how can you put either of those in charge of of, of, a, of this kind of game when they support one of the clubs? It's absolutely ludicrous. Why? How, you can't do it. You can't do it, can you? But that would make more sense. Like that to me would be def- that would be defensible at least. Like that would that goes back to the at least you'd have a a logical. This is where I'm saying that they're just so in- incoherent. Meaning that if you, if you take you know people at their word, they, they they're professionals and they wouldn't allow the club that they support to overtly you know bias them. Um, I get that. Like that's a reasonable professional angle to take. You would put one of those two people in charge of VAR of this game. If they're the only two people that have like the highest level of, of training and certification. So now we're, we're into this, like, well, we we're going to have to put beaten in to get it up because of the response to the hearts game. Um, but to counteract that, because we don't want to show that we're, you know, choosing favorites. We got to put column in because we don't want to look like we were intimidated after the New Year's thing. And oh, we have to worry about these two guys because they're both Ranger supporters. We can't put them in charge. I mean, I don't usually. Who's, ma- who's swear making? On this who's show, making but what the fuck are these people doing? It's insane. It? Yeah, the level of it, it's insanity. They've created. They've created this situation well, for themselves. Yeah, of course, it's, it's nuts. Um... It's, it's like a kangaroo it's, court. It's, it's 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 incredible how ridiculous they run it. Independent of any of the Celtic specific, you know, angle, like just objectively step mm-hmm. back and look at the decision making here. Yeah, it's nuts. Well, what it is is weaponized incompetence. It's, <laughs> it, like exactly. it's 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 what everyone expects them to do because oh, I mean. Like, what else are we going to do? You know, it's I, like it's the it's the boyfriend that doesn't wash his dishes because he he doesn't know how to do it the right way. You know, that's that, that, that's what this is. Is weaponize the confidence. The, well, um, I, I, they're I, use, I, they're the using refereeing service. Sorry, Jenda. The refereeing service is hermetically sealed end to end within the confines of the Scottish Football Association and all of the cultural implications of that. Every aspect of refereeing, from identification of candidates through to promotion to UEFA and FIFA, and all of the aspects of the job in between are hermetically sealed and under the head of refereeing operations. Okay? There is no oversight. There is no governance. There is no... They mark their own freaking homework, essentially, right? They mark their own homework. There is no separation of duties, right? A very common and obvious business risk control concept, separation of duties, doesn't exist. And so the whole thing needs to be radically reformed, radically reformed, and it needs outside influence, out, people outside of the culture, outside of the SFA, who are competent and professional and know how to run a refereeing service to come in and rip it up and start again. Well, I, I, I should disclose this. I, I emailed my congressman um, about the availability of Crawford Allen in case we need a new secretary of state in the United States uh, to head up a large bureaucratic organization that's horribly run and incompetent. Um, <laughs> Trump. Surely. <laughs> Maybe that's what we need. We just need a strong man like Trump to come in and uh, <laughs> fix the SFA. Yeah. 
And, <laughs> right, so he thinks of himself as a strong man, didn't he? <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to rein in this howling. Rein in, because that's 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 what we're going to be accused of. Two X G in, in thirty, 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, right. So we're nearly an hour in. It's that time of the derby preview where I annoy you for a prediction. Who wants to go first? Huh. Oh, James is still calming down, isn't he? You've, you've been, yeah, you've that's the first that's the yeah. angry genuinely one of the angriest I, i've seen james in the um, four years now that you've seen, so we're, now that we're you've seen all the data you see he was just a kind of on the fence data guy until he saw all the data now now he understands but yeah uh, listen it's what i'm angry about is not even that alan it, it's <laughs> it's the human cost of this i, I agree because of the incompetence it, again it, independent because if if rangers win the game for whatever reason on sunday it's going to be a mess same thing. Celtic win, it's going to be a mess. And Beaton and Walsh and these people are being, you know, set up to be slaughtered in public. They're being, they're being sacrificial lambs uh, because of people that are their nominal bosses that are incompetent douchebags. That, and that's what's infuriating to me. Um, because of pa- Casa Paul over what should be by far the biggest game that this league has seen in years. Two evenly matched teams in a legit title race. It should be about the football. It should be about the players. And it should be about the managers. And how these things, you know, professional athletes and professional analysts and, and trainers and managers are going on a pitch and, you know, competing it out. You know, that's what this should be about. And we're stuck talking about this bullshit that has to be talked about because of these maniacs. That's what's infuriating to me. So, so, so I'm, what I'm hearing is 2 0 Celtic, James. Is that right? Penalty <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the first minute. Yeah. Go ahead, Alan. You got to go. I got I to gotta drink some water here and calm no. down. Listen, you know, if, if we if we ignore all of that, which I know we can, and and, and that's really sad. Obviously, I think it is sad. Uh, is that if you just looked at it as a matchup between managers, styles, and players, I, I do honestly believe, from an analytical perspective, Celtic have got the stronger team, and they the strengths of how Celtic play are, in terms of you know, James talks a lot about boxing and matchups and styles makes fights. Celtic's counterattacking ability, which they don't get to evidence in. Um, most league games um, is, is a latent skill, I think, that's there, a latent ability in the team, will have a chance to shine uh, in this particular match. And I think that could be too strong. Uh, so I think well, if I look at the strengths of one team and the weaknesses of the other, I think the strengths of Celtic really prey on the, the weaknesses of the home team. I think the strengths of the home team, I think Celtic are, are kind of OK, if I'm, I'm generalising, obviously, from an analysis perspective. But, you know, it's an away game with no fans and all that. And, and that first goal is going to be crucial because it's the difference between an absolutely bouncing, raging mob, you know, in full voice versus quiet, you know, grumbling, uh, uncertain, piling pressure on Taverny and, and, and all the others, etc. Uh, so that first goal is going to be crucial. But objectively, from a data perspective, I think Celtic have got the better team. Whether that matters on the day, we don't know. Yeah, I, I would um, I would agree with that. Um, if all other things being equal, unfortunately, I don't think that they are right, and, and I think that that's um, not not only, and I, I mean that specifically relative to the quality of the teams. So um, you know, I as I said, I think the Kyogo factor is a huge plus. Rel- also within the context of what Alan's saying as far as strengths and weaknesses of the style of play and you know the matchup of styles in this specific game. But we're, all other things are not equal because of the fitness issues and the competitive issues that we're talking about with some of our best players. Um, and that's where I have the concerns that I mentioned earlier. Um, is, you know, uh, I agree with you, and uh, ramping up for Hitate, for example, is important, but he has not been facing athletes and with the speed and quickness that he's going to face on Sunday. Um, so that, that fine margin of timing of passes, the decision, you know, the brain getting back into recognize, reckon, pattern recognition and decision-making quickly 
Um, is that going to be refined to the point where against this level of, of competition, I, I worry about that. Um, the other thing is, again, independent of any of the other stuff that we just talked about as far as match officiating is regardless of the official, they, the way they tend to officiate these matches in Scotland is a little more hands off. And I, I do think that that, um, uh, that permissiveness that's, I would expect to be likely does mute some of our strength relative to counterattacking. Meaning that if they're allowed to foul proactively as part of a high press, um, which would be smart by them, by the way, like that's how I would strategize if I was Rangers going into this game. If I decide to go high press is that if it looks like you're, you know, they're going to break us, you know, through this press, then yeah, take the foul. Like, and don't drag someone down necessarily, obviously, but, you know, be smart about fouling proactively because I suspect the official is going to allow a lot of those, at least, uh, particularly in the first 20 minutes, um, before any kind of cards get brandished. Um, so I, I, I think it's, you know, at best, probably um, a toss up kind of game. And my, my other issue is I, I worry that they do have the depth advantage um, at this point, again, relative to them getting some players back and have a little bit more depth and the athletic profile of those players. So when we get into the last half hour, if they bring on a SEMA and a Matondo, all the limitations that those two players have is they are freaking fast. <laughs> right. And, and who do we have to bring on, you know, maybe Yang, you could argue. Um, but what game changes do we have coming off of the bench that introduce, you know, what we saw under Ange, which is late subs that can just blow pie tiring you know, defenses. So it's th those kind of things that, you know, worry me a little bit. So I, I'll say 2-2 two, two draw, and I'd be happy with it. Um, generally speaking, I'd be happy with a draw. I'm going to go 2-1 Celtic. Uh, James Tavernier penalty on the uh, 81st to 85th uh, minute just to make things <laughs> Thanks a little support bit. That. It's going to be way earlier than that. <laughs> well, uh, either a penalty or a free kick. Where well, that's the other uh, issue that he, we have to worry about. Sticks it in the top corner oh. um, from the edge of the box because somebody dived in and gave away a stupid foul. And, and that, you know, again, that's something that they've shown. You know that that is a relative advantage for them, um, and that has not been Hart's strength this season <laughs> is stopping free kicks from distance. He's shown that on on multiple occasions. Um, including in uh, that, that last Derby match. So, um, yeah. I, it, yeah, Hart almost needs to start moving before the person hitting the free kick actually starts his run-up uh, in order to get to the far corner these days. So uh, hopefully, it, hopefully it doesn't come to that. Hopefully Celtic do get the win. And hopefully at least it's going to be an enjoyable game. I cannot stand when these big games uh, end up being, you know, damp squibs and and boring and uh, you can't really accuse the derby of being boring the last couple of years so um hopefully we get an entertaining one and one that Give, we're not given just the, standing the given the externalities and people. the context going into this game it cannot be boring even if it is a boring um, game it will be <laughs> laundered into an incredibly psycho mess mm. All right, well, I think that's where we will park the podcast for this week. We will be back with a review of this podcast uh, early next week. Hopefully we can get it arranged on time and uh, we'll, all three of us will hop on a call to look back on uh, John Beaton's performance. Or, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, mean, uh, I mean how Rio Hatate got, in, uh, got a, in, on in midfield. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. Uh, all right, if you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, hit the like and leave a comment. If you're watching on podcast, thanks every week for uh, tuning in to us and we will chat to you next week.